The Denver Broncos pass rush could take a massive step forward here in 2023. We're going to take a look at the Broncos top three edge guys on today's brand new episode of the show. You are locked on Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast, part of the locked on podcast network, your team every day. What's up, Broncos country? Welcome into a brand new episode of Lockdown Broncos, your daily Denver Broncos podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you so much once again to all the everydayers out there in Broncos country who tune in and make us your first listen of the day every single day. Just a reminder, you can get Lockdown Broncos for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast. Do us a favor, hit that subscribe or that follow button so you never miss out on what's going on with your favorite football team every single day. All year long. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use code Locked On NFL for twenty dollars off your first purchase. I'm Cody Rourke, Broncos reporter from Mile High Sports, joined alongside, as always, by Sarah Bettinger, site expert over there, predominantlyorange.com. Sarah, as we get closer to the buildup for the NFL draft, we all know this is the week that the Broncos voluntary off-season workouts they've begun. There's not a lot that we're going to get from that, but we are one step closer, about twenty weeks away. From the NFL season kicking off. And next week, obviously, is a big week. The NFL draft will be here. But in the buildup to the draft, we'll focus on some of the in house items that this Broncos roster has right now. And really, I think pass rusher has to be talked about a little bit more. I think that there's a maybe question amongst Broncos country as to what this group looks like. Is it good enough going into 2024? As is, what is the plan? Should they maybe draft a guy 12th overall? Ideally, we've discussed it here on the show. Denver feels very, very good about the three young guys that they have at the edge rusher position, and we all are going to start things off here, obviously, with Jonathan Cooper. Jonathan Cooper, who has given the Broncos some of the best return on investment for a seventh-round pick, I think probably since Trevor Simeon, right, who became the starting quarterback once upon a time. So I don't know that there's been many better seventh-round picks in recent Broncos history unless you count the flash in the pan, Cody. That was the Chad Kelly preseason stardom there but all kidding aside look Jonathan Cooper has really proven himself to be one of those types of guys that you feel like you can build around culturally I mean his development has been as we oftentimes say it's it's not always this straight up trajectory but I feel like for Jonathan Cooper it kind of has been that way you know we saw glimpses his rookie year we saw even more glimpses his second year and then in his third year with his most expanded role yet see him go out there eight and a half sacks leads the team he was kind of a, a you know he changed the number kind of felt like he took on a different level of like seriousness to the role in terms of okay yeah you, you did your thing on special teams you came in the rotation and made a couple splash plays but what can you do on a more consistent basis I feel like we saw a huge step forward from him and he's one of those types of guys that you just feel like you you can count on week in and week out is his game perfect at this point no but he's somebody that I feel like he's he's got a really high floor at the position as long as he stays healthy I think the best is yet to come here for Jonathan Cooper though right but this is a big season for Coop because it is a contract year now I remember going back to his rookie season we were hearing it in mini camp we were hearing it during training camp like Who's this number 53 guy? Like he's at, he's pressuring the quarterback, just high motor, just getting after guys. And it ended up being Jonathan Cooper, who actually had a little bit of an impact, especially in that Cowboys game when the Broncos went into Dallas and beat down Dak Prescott and those guys there. We saw a lot more from Jonathan Cooper, like, oh, this guy could be special, right? And then you go obviously into 2022, you know, Denver overall, their defense under Giro Evero was really the bright spot of that team that season, even though that the conversation surrounded the offense a lot of that year. And then this past year, we really got to see Jonathan Cooper, I think, kind of break out into a little bit of a bigger role. Like the moment the Broncos moved on from Randy Gregory, the moment they moved on from Frank Clark, Jonathan Cooper, Nick Benito became the top two guys because Barron was still injured at this point here for Denver. And all of a sudden, in that one game we saw against the Chicago Bears, Nick Benito making one play, Jonathan Cooper with the scoop and score, the you know scoop, there it is, touchdown. Denver, obviously, that was a huge catalyst to them winning that game in Chicago. That was a big win for them, right? But we saw Jonathan Cooper lead the way this year in terms of overall sacks with the team, eight and a half sacks so far in the season. He had 22 pressures from his position right there, which, I mean, that's a lot of pressure, Sarah, for an outside edge rush guy. And we talk about the timing of today's NFL and how fast quarterbacks, they're getting the ball out of their hands. 
what Jonathan Cooper did, now it wasn't double-digit sacks. I think everyone's trying to get that double-digit sack guy back into the mix, which will be nice for Denver. But I think what we saw from Jonathan Cooper was huge. But we also have to factor in, and we talked about this all offseason as well, maybe Denver's edge rush wasn't consistent enough last year because their defensive interior, the D-line, really, really struggled. We'll see if that kind of gets fixed this year with the addition of Malcolm Roach, and who knows what they're going to do in the NFL draft. But ideally, I think that Jonathan Cooper is in a great position. It's a contract year, and we all know he plays with a chip on his shoulder. I can tell you that. He's a hungry guy. I've had a chance to talk to him. You know, it, it, Last season, I had a chance to talk to him a little bit. His level of focus is through the roof right now. So I'm very, very excited to see what he can do. But there are areas in his game in which he can get better, Sarah, and I think one of those being – against the run, against the edge a little bit more, right? He's a high motor guy, but last year Denver got gashed on the outside a little bit too much last year, I think for our liking. Yeah, they definitely did. And that's an area of the team that, like you said, I mean, could that be impacted by the upgrades on the defensive line? I mean, even just with Malcolm Roach coming in, you expect the Broncos to be improved in that area of their defense. And certainly with guys like Cooper and even other guys that we're discussing on the show today, Baron Browning, Nick Benito. I mean, what has been the concern for all of these guys coming out of college? People are like, yeah, we love the pass rush abilities, but can they hold up as full-time edge players? And what does that mean? Well, it means, can you hold up against the run when, when teams design run plays to come right at you? Can you bust plays up in the, in the backfield there? So I think there's so much that that works together on the defensive front that's going to help this Broncos yeah. team be better and these players individually be better. The question that I have is, is with Jonathan Cooper and any of these other guys, how much better could they be if the Broncos did have a, I mean, let's say somebody that's as good as Bradley Chubb. We'll not go back to prime Von Miller, but let's just say if, if Bradley Chubb was still there on the other side of the line of scrimmage, you feel like Jonathan Cooper could be much better individually and that he would be able to take advantage of more opportunities. I mean, that's the main question. And I think when, when you talk about kind of this, this tension with fans that are observing the team and watching the team and, and clamoring for certain players ahead of the 2024 NFL draft, like the sect of people out there that wants the Broncos to take Jared verse or whoever it may be Dallas Turner at the top of this draft. Do you really believe that this edge room could benefit from having somebody like that? Or are they just, are they going to always be the sum of their parts the way that they are currently? I think that's, is there a ceiling, I guess, is what the question that I'm asking to what these guys can do without somebody like that? Or do you believe these defensive line additions can really make this, this whole unit that much better? I think we saw a little bit of that last year, to be honest with you. I think that's an area that we did notice for the Denver overall, but you know, I think a, another element to this as well is, okay, like, d is the rotation behind these guys good enough as well? Which I know we're going to dive deeper to that because Nick Benito is going to factor into it. Are they going to add a guy into the mix of the NFL draft? These are obviously things we'll discuss here on today's episode of the show. But, I mean, I do think that the Broncos are in a position right now where the pass rush with where Sean Payton is at, he's even kind of pinpointed it as well. He's talked about it. He believes that these young guys – can do it like he's got a lot of confidence in them and so I think he's going to invest further in them going forward here and that's going to lead us into our next conversation as well because we talk about Jonathan Cooper being in a contract year another player who's in a contract year is Baron Browning who has all the potential in the world and has some flashes to Von Miller what will his contract year look like for the Broncos we'll talk about that and much more in today's brand new episode Locked on Broncos this show of Lockdown Broncos is sponsored by BetterHelp, and a lot of us spend our lives wishing that we had more time, more time for what, more time to spend with our family, our loved ones, or more time just to find peace of mind. The question is, if time was unlimited, how would you use it? And the best way to squeeze that special thing into your schedule is to know what's important to you and to make it a priority, and therapy can help you find what matters to you so you can do more of it. That's where BetterHelp can come in handy for you. Now, in the past, I've utilized BetterHelp myself, and the thing I liked about it, it was super easy to sign up. I filled out a brief survey. I got matched to a licensed therapist within minutes. I set up my first appointment, and luckily my therapist and I, we vibed really well. She helped me work on things like stress, stress relief, anxiety, time management, just ways that I could be more effective because that was an area in which I was struggling with and it was a benefit to me. Now, therapy could also be a benefit to you. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online. It's designed to be convenient, flexible, and best of all, best suited to match your schedule wherever you're at. You can do it at home. You can do it in your bed. You can sit on your couch and do it. 
That's the convenience of BetterHelp. All you do is just fill a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge if you need a therapist. Just don't vibe well. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash locked on today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P.com slash locked on. Can Baron Browning become a second contract player for the Denver Broncos? Could he become a big money contract player for the Broncos here as he approaches his fourth NFL season? We're going to talk about Baron Browning and maybe how he factors into this team's 2024 NFL draft plans because his athleticism, his abilities, they loom large, Broncos country. But I want to say thank you, first and foremost, to every single one of you that makes Lockdown Broncos your first listen of the day, every single day, wherever and however you get your podcasts free and available, always right here on the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. And you can also watch the show on YouTube. And Cody, I think really this is a, a great topic for Broncos country to sound off in the discussion and things like that and let us know their thoughts because – Look, the, the edge position has become a bit of a point of contention this offseason. I think we we saw great progression last year from Jonathan Cooper, like we talked about. We saw progression from Nick Benito, who we will talk about. The one X factor was Baron Brown, right? Because he was supposed to be, after switching positions on a full-time basis, we saw in 2022, I mean, the dominant flashes against the Indianapolis Colts. We saw stretches of play where it was like, Man, you could you could just count on this guy to be a 10 sack player a year every single year with the the traits that he has. But the injury at the beginning of last season really derailed kind of the ability to make concrete future plans. I think as far as where you project Baron Browning, is that kind of how you see it as far as is the team do you feel like the team feels restricted in making concrete future plans and say, no, we're gonna build around Baron? Or do you feel like they they view him still the same way we did maybe after 2022, where it's like, man, the traits, the the Von Miller flashes, you know, all those different things. Where do you think the Broncos are heading into the 2024 draft? I think that they feel that Barron could still very well be that guy, that the high trait guy that we've talked about that we've seen. And I think that they're obviously looking and, and like being cautious about like the injury stuff. But, you know, I think for Barron, I think the context that's missing for a lot of Broncos fans that don't know this about Barron is, I think the knee injury happened, if I'm not mistaken, against the New York Jets two seasons ago, right? And it was the game where Zach Wilson was running all over the Broncos, evading pressure left and right, like doing a bunch of crazy stuff. It started in that game, but then he ended up continuing to play. Like he came back, but he was playing on a knee that was already like a torn meniscus. And so he thought ideally, and I think overall, like the knee felt good, but then there were some things that they were doing and it started to like get that, that pulling and that clicking feeling inside the knee, you know, something that... If you know exactly what that's like, if you've ever had a meniscus injury, you know exactly what I'm talking about here. But he felt restricted in that movement there. So one thing he did was obviously he had the surgery. That led to Denver going out and obviously getting Frank Clark, which everyone's like, wait, what's what's going on here? Is this more so Denver's adding to try to bolster that room, or is this just a move to replace you know Barron while he's out for an injury? Like They had no idea how long the timeline was going to be. But they were very patient with it, right? And so obviously in nine games, and like the first nine games we saw from Barron, like we started to see that pressure. We started to see him get his feet underneath him just a little bit more. And in 10 games total that he played, he finished with four and a half sacks. And I remember he had a huge impact. Like, Sarah, I want to go back to that Kansas City Chiefs game, which was the highlight, in my opinion, I think, if Broncos country had to take something away from the 2023 year. That game where Denver beat the Chiefs, Barron, his pass rush, like, he was so persistent in chasing around Patrick Mahomes that Patrick ran into his own guy, fell down, Barron finished the play. Like from the onset, I think his first game back was against Jordan Love and the Green Bay Packers, and we saw the pressure. But I think the one thing we also see with Barron as well that I'd say probably is like the biggest critique in his game, his get off is so fast that he is calm and he's prone to multiple, you know, offsides penalties, which I feel like sometimes you can live with, sometimes you can live without. But Overall, the player is still there. The guy that they think he can be is still there. And I think that we could see a little bit more of that here this upcoming season under Vance Joseph as he looks to really kind of revamp things here. Like it seems like Denver is going to be running it back at edge rusher. And with a healthy Baron Brown and going into training camp, Sarah, I really, really like the optics of that. I'm very excited for what that may look like. Well, and not to mention, I think something that's really fascinating about this year's incoming draft class when you because I think we have to kind of view these edge guys through the lens of, all right, what's what's also coming in? You look at Baron Browning, he just turned 
25, Cody, and I've got a list of some of the top edge guys in this draft. I mean, Jared Verse, he's he's almost he's going to be 24 this season. Chop Robinson, I mean, he, I mean, I, this is th this list of prospects coming in just in general is older, and and yeah. that's due to the fact that these guys have had you know five six years of eligibility. I mean, a lot of the guys atop this edge list, I'm looking here, Cody, some are even over 24 years of age. So I think you have to factor that in when you're looking at somebody like Baron Browning, like a lot of the guys in this incoming draft class at any position, not just edge, but they might already be like 23, 24 years old. So you're kind of weighing this. OK, Baron, he just turned 25. Like we're kind of we're kind of saying, hey, we, we believe in this other guy who's only two years behind, but has three years less NFL experience, you know, and is, I mean, there's, there's so much there that I think has to be discussed when it comes to a guy like Browning and traits, because in the NFL draft, you're betting on traits, you're betting on things that you don't necessarily know what's going to happen. And so I find his development fascinating. We saw him also change the Jersey number this off season. He's going to be wearing number five this coming year, which is his college number. So mm -hmm. maybe a little bit of a, repeat of what we saw last year from Jonathan Cooper, who had the breakout year when he changed his number. And I think Cody, there is something that goes into that. It's just when you, uh, for, I'm not trying to read too much into this, but a guy like that, who's changing his Jersey number, what that says to me is like, I feel comfortable in my, I, I feel comfortable in the way that I'm going to play because you don't change your number and then go out there and, and, th you know, throw up a, a donut or something like that yeah. you're, you're not gonna he's not gonna be shut out when it comes to rushing the passer things like that and so i really feel confident about baron browning i feel like he's somebody that you bet on the traits he's only 25 years old he's somebody that you you didn't at george payton that's part of his first ever draft class in denver so i think the goal ultimately always has been he wants to be able to re-sign those guys yeah. and we know that sean payton has final say and whatnot but Barron is one of those guys that I do feel like the Broncos, man, they they want to get him to a second contract. And however that's going to happen, if it means drafting somebody higher to make him his life easier, that's whatever. I mean, great. Good for them. But Barron is somebody that I hope it can work out because his traits are off the charts. Well, and in comparison to some of the NFL draft prospects, you mentioned they can be older at the position as well. You mentioned like obviously they have a lot of great traits, right? You talked about the the lack of overall NFL experience, whereas we've seen with Barron, Barron has shown that at the NFL level, like his dip, his get off, his go, like he's got like these different arsenal of pass rush moves and so much that we're like, hey, you take away, like you cover his jersey number on film, you think it's Von Miller in certain situations. Like Barron, in my opinion, not only is he a highly athletic and explosive option, but I feel like he's probably going to be, he might put on five or six more pounds of muscle this off season and try to really anchor to become a power rusher, right? Like he's got the speed and athleticism, but if he can really get the power down and start to where he can extend, like if he's lining up on the left side, he can take his right arm in terms of a bull rush and stab that against the tad, the shoulder of the offensive tackle for a power rush. I think that Barron is going to be a very, very fun player to watch here in 2024 like this is the best case scenario right like these are the things that we're talking about worst case scenario Barron struggles with injuries once again and it makes Denver really question what they want to do because it's hard to extend a player that you know has had some injuries there but I would say his overall history isn't as concerning as maybe some of the other positions or players that they've had at the position in the past so that might just be something like hey you know he was injured you know, he had to have surgery, but he came back and he looked really good. So I think that's not a worry for me because he did stay healthy in those final stretch of games. And from the time he returned off of injured reserve, I'm very curious. I'm excited to see number five this year. Look, look, think about that. Number zero, Jonathan Cooper on one side. Number five, Baron Brown. You got a lot of single digits on that defense. I personally, I love that. I think that's what makes the aesthetic of viewing football a little bit more pleasing on the eye. But that's just me there. Broncos country. Let us know your thoughts here on Baron Browning. What expectations do you have for him as he prepares for a contract season? There's another player we're going to talk about that's really in an interesting position because of his rise last season. What does it project for year three for Nick Benito? We'll break that down and much more on today's brand new episode, Locked on Broncos. Today's episode of Lockdown Broncos is brought to you by our friends over there at the Game Time app. And look, folks, MLB season is here. And if you've been wanting to go to the ballpark and you go to find tickets, but all of a sudden the prices, they keep rising the closer it gets to pitch, that can be frustrating. Well, let me tell you about Game Time because Game Time, they're now an authorized ticket marketplace 
of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even easier. And it's also a faster process as well. And prices on the Game Time app, they actually go down the closer it gets to the first pitch. With killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets. Not only can you get MLB tickets, but if you got a concert that's coming up, I just went to the Red Rocks and saw Elderbrook. And guess what? I went out there and I used Game Time to get my tickets where I got them significantly cheaper than other places there. The one thing I also like about Game Time is that you get views from your seat, a panoramic view based on wherever you buy your ticket. It gives you the vantage point. What is the action going to be like when you go to your concert, your baseball game, football game, whatever event you're going to? What's the action going to look like? It shows you inside of that. Plus, they have all-in pricing, which shows you your total up front. So you know that there are no surprise, fee surprise fees that are going to come up your way at checkout. So check it out. Take the guess we're kind of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app. Create an account. And use code LOCKEDONNFL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, Create an account, redeem code, locked on, NFL for $20 off. Download the Game Time app. Last minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. What will Nick Benito's third season in the NFL look like? After taking a massive jump from his rookie season to his second year, Nick Benito looked like one of the most improved players for the Broncos defense last season. Could that lead to more opportunities here? in 2024 that's something we'll break down on today's brand new episode of lockdown broncos real quick I want to say thank you so much to everybody in broncos country for tuning in to lockdown broncos if you're enjoying watching us on youtube just a reminder you can take us with you everywhere you go in your pocket wherever you get your podcast if you want to listen to the audio version as well lockdown broncos is here for you every single day all year long sarah let's talk about nick bonito who i i think really after his rookie season you and I had some conversations here on the show, and we said the Broncos, they're going to need a little bit more. Like There is pressure on Nick Benito to take a jump. And I tell you what, he looked like an entirely different player. And we saw in the onset, the moment that training camp began, he was the one player defensively that consistently stood out, in my opinion, day in and day out. We talk about his get-off. We talk about just his speed rush. Like If he's getting to a quarterback, he's there. And then you followed up by getting after Matthew Stafford in joint training camp practices. You saw it then. Then you see it in the regular season. Nick Benito, second leading sack artist for the Broncos last season with eight, just half sack behind Jonathan Cooper. But get this, he was a consistent pressure player. Like we've hear, heard Sean Payton use that term quite a bit. 24 pressures for Benito last year. He missed a couple of games due to the MCL sprain, but came back and just had that high motor to him once again. Very improved, led the team in tackles for a loss behind the scrimmage as well. So to me, Sarah, Nick is in a position right now where I think the Broncos are looking at it. If Jonathan Cooper, Baron Browning, if one of them, is their price tag is a little too high or they don't feel like one of those guys can be the guy going forward, this is where Nick Benito has an opportunity to jump into the mix here long term here for the Broncos. He definitely does. I mean, I, I don't want to necessarily pin him to this because I know there's a bit of a stigma around this guy, but somebody like Yannick Ngakwe, Cody, who comes to mind when you think of Nick Benito. Like, is he ever going to get to that level of being an elite run stopper? I don't know if that's necessarily his game, but we did see some TFLs last year from Benito on top of the sacks, right? I mean, 13 tackles for loss, 20 quarterback hits. You mentioned the eight sacks, 24 total pressures, according to Pro Football Reference. So, there's a lot of there's a lot happening behind the line of scrimmage for Nick Benito. I think now what's the next step for him? What does his third year look like? Can you now get the ball out a few more times? We know you can get into the backfield, 24 pressures, eight sacks, 20 quarterback hits. We know you can get to the quarterback. Can you now get the ball out at a high rate? Because I think that's what's going to make Nick Benito the most money going forward. We know that he's going to be, I think, eight sacks, Cody. That's really just scratching the surface for what his game is. I mean, his get off is incredible. We talked about the comparisons to Von Miller at the time that he was drafted. I mean, when you look at his 10 yard split, when you look at his 40 yard dash, the physical makeup, everything is there. Such a naturally gifted pass rusher and somebody that I think he's eight sacks is kind of the minimum of what you expect from a guy like Nick Benito on a year to year basis. How high can he climb that number? How high can it go? Because he's not only somebody who could rack up the sacks, he's somebody that I think can make a huge difference in a, he, he doesn't need 800 snaps to do it, right? He doesn't need yeah. to be out there every single play. He can be out there 500, 600 snaps a season and give you 
12 to 15 sacks. But can you get that that forced fumble number up? That's where I think he's going to make the most difference this coming season is can you create more turnovers? Because like you talked about, the scoop and score against the Chicago Bears, how much more of that can we see from Nick Benito going forward? I think that's going to determine really – whether or not he's a long-term fixture on this team, as opposed to the guys that we've already talked about in Browning and Cooper. When I feel like the overall perspective of Benito hasn't changed. I mean, entirely like after his rookie season, fans were very frustrated with like his level of performance to play. He could hardly get onto the field, even though the Denver was decimated with injuries. But then all of a sudden you'd see him take such a drastic step forward. And it's like, all right, is that because like the Broncos actually put him in a position to succeed? And I think Jamar Kane had a lot to do with that. And obviously outside linebacker coach Michael Wilhoyt did a fantastic job. But now you have Jamar Kane as your defensive line specialist. Like, I think we could even see the Broncos get very creative with some of their personnel packages going forward. Like right now, obviously, I think the projected starting lineup is going to be for Denver outside backers, going to be Jonathan Cooper and obviously Baron Browning. But in times where Nick Benito, like if he's coming in in a rotational role and he's getting eight sacks, like that's impressive. Like that's something you're like, all right, hey, like he's not even the feature guy yet. And to your point earlier, he's not getting as many snaps, but he's putting up tremendous numbers, better production than maybe even some of the starters are doing in some of those situations. I also think the thing about Nick that I'm very curious to see this upcoming season is – Will he be on the field in like some clutch situations? Can he like, I think you and I are both maybe in the same boat here and Broncos country can feel free to chime in anytime they want to about this. But we've been talking about the moment that the Broncos traded away Von Miller, they traded away Bradley Chubb. We've all been asking the question, is there a guy here at the edge rusher position that can emerge and in clutch moments, be the guy that's going to close the game for you, right? If the defense is on the field, they need to stop. They're going to come up with a strip sack or they're going to come up with a big sack that forces them into like a third and 20, whatever it may be. And it gives your defense an advantage. Are any of these guys in that position? I think that Denver's got a, a variety here. I think that they have a very promising three man group right here, which to my point, I want to go back and reiterate, sir. Like I said, somebody I talked to in the Broncos organization told me they feel like between Baron, between Jonathan, between Nick, they feel like between one of these three guys, they believe that they have a star pass rusher in the mix on the roster. And we are looking, I think all forward to seeing that. And like, that's something you want to see happen, but they believe one of these three guys can emerge into becoming a premier guy in the national football league. And to me, that's a little exciting. I think that the outlook at edge rusher right now, sir, I think it's split. Like if you ask me, I'm not as concerned about it. I think I've gotten a lot of comments on Twitter. I've gotten comments here on YouTube. I'm sure you have as well, where fans are probably a little bit more concerned about edge rusher. I feel like in comparison to a couple of years, we talked about the inside linebacker position, our concern from there and it ended up being the biggest surprise. I think that's where edge rusher is heading this year for the Broncos. And we haven't even talked about Drew Sanders yet, who really is right now. We don't know. It's a big question mark, but we can talk about it in the conversation of being a potential edge rusher for Denver this year as well. He's a major wild card in this discussion, isn't he? Because we just uh, we're so in the dark. I know George Payton said that they think that he can play the edge position, but man, that's not really ideal for where the Broncos are at right now. It's just not. I mean, uh, the most optimistic overlook of this unit right now is that all these guys play so well in 2024 that, man, we got to find a way to keep Jonathan Cooper. We've got to find a way to keep Baron Browning, which leaves Drew Sanders where exactly? I mean, I don't I don't know the answer to that question because Nick Bonito, he's got two years left on his deal. And and so I don't know where that leaves the the Broncos, especially man. If they take a an edge player in the first round and Drew Sanders is moved to the edge, that would be a clear indictment on that draft selection. So I don't know that we can put any stock into where what his projection is at this point, especially because we do like these three guys. Like these yeah. three guys produce as pass rushers; they just do. And so it's it's a matter of I, I don't think Drew Sanders really. I don't think he's that number one edge guy for you. I just don't think he's that type of player. So that's what the Broncos, if anything, if they need anything, they need somebody to step into that role and take pressure off everyone else to make everybody else better. If it's somebody that's already on the roster, great. If you draft somebody, great. But I think it's going to be one of those three guys that we talked about and not Drew Sanders necessarily emerging into that spot. Well, Broncos country, let us know how you feel about Denver's pass rush, their edge rush group. In my opinion, I believe that they could take a huge step forward here in 2024. We talked about what that may look like, some of the concerns that we also may have at the position. But we want to hear from you if you're listening or watching the Lockdown Broncos, wherever you get your podcasts or available 
on YouTube. The buildup for the NFL draft continues as that will approach the Broncos as they continue to work through meetings to build their big board ahead of next week's massive event. We'll have you cover all week long and in the buildup next week here on the Locked On Broncos podcast. But with that said, that'll wrap up today's episode of the show. Broncos country, appreciate you so much for tuning in, watching, listening, wherever you get your podcasts or on YouTube. Sarah and myself will be back tomorrow for a brand new episode of the show.